Our gospel lesson today and the focus of our sermon is John 18, chapter 12 through 27. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of the man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. And Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, so they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. When I say the word guilt, what from your life do you imagine? What from your life do you remember? It could be any number of things, big or small, right? It could be a little white lie. It could be a one-night stand. A temper that got out of hand and led you to say things you didn't want to say, or one too many drinks, three too many drinks. A lie so outlandish that you're still not sure why you said it. It could be Rather than, than one moment, it could be a season, an, an entire time frame in which you, you were doing things that you knew you shouldn't do or wished now you didn't do. Things that maybe ruined your health or shipwrecked your finances or maybe that you regret about the way you raised your kids. Whatever the case, the result is the same, right? Guilt. Guilt, and, and it's a powerful thing, isn't it? Guilt is, is powerful and universal and in the way that it lingers and is heavy and is lonely, and it deflates us, doesn't it? Leaves, it leaves us feel defeated when we let it. Wondering, am I ever going to get over this? Am I ever going to stop doing this? Maybe, maybe it makes you more stressful and fearful. Is anyone going to find out? Maybe for you, it just makes you relive and replay in your head moment after moment. Could I have said that differently? Could I have done that differently? Well, we all have our own stories of guilt, and Scripture is no stranger to stories of guilt. And tonight, we're going to explore just one instance of guilt in the life of one of Jesus' disciples, Peter. We could go any number of ways with Peter and guilt, actually, but 
We'll focus on the guilt uh, that Peter experiences over those denials of Jesus. It starts actually not in that time when he's warming his hands over the fire. Peter's guilt goes all the way back to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus warns that the disciples, you're not going to be able to follow me when I go to the cross. Where I'm about to go, you can't follow. And and Peter Peter is, is heartbroken by this statement. Leads him to say, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. He makes that bold claim. I'm going to do it. Don't worry. I will follow you. As Peter says these things, you have to wonder, what was Peter thinking about? Is it other moments of guilt? Maybe he's thinking of that time where he's walking on water, and then he begins to sink. He begins to doubt, and and he has to have Jesus save him, to catch him as he fell. Maybe maybe Peter was thinking of that moment where, where he's blessed to say to Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But then moments later, Jesus says to the same man, to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Awfully big reason for guilt. As he dwelled on these past fumbles, would he have been wondering, is Jesus cutting me off? Is he, am, am I not allowed to follow anymore? H- have I blown it? Is this too far? This is what guilt does, right? It makes us question ourselves, our relationships to other people, our ability to be connected to them. It makes us feel isolated and alone. It separates us from other people as we do. And for all we know, and this is just as logical, Peter was sitting there thinking, Jesus, you called me to follow you. Why can't I follow you now? Maybe he was thinking of all of it. But whatever the case, Peter makes that fateful claim. Oh no, Jesus, I will lay down my life for you. Now, it's easy as we hear this to judge Peter. That kind of bold statement is is so easy to make. It's, It's so quick to roll off the tongue with bravado and pride. I, all those other disciples might not Jesus, but I will follow. Hubris, we might call it. But the funny thing is, Many of us have made those same claims at our confirmation, haven't we? When we stood there to be confirmed, the pastor read these words to us. Do you intend to continue steadfast in this confession and church and to suffer all, even death, rather than fall away from it? What did we say? What do all of our new members say? Yes, by the grace of God. It's easy to make the claim. It can be hard to live up to it. And and as we think about those claims that we make so quickly at at the young age of 13, how many of us have fallen away from those confirmation promises at one time or another? How many of us have made made panicked promises in the midst of prayer? Lord, if you'll just help me get through this one thing, I I, I will. How How did you fill in the blanks? Did you live up to your promise? It's easy to make the claim. It can be hard to live up to the promise. And when you don't live up to the promise, what do you have? Guilt. Guilt that lingers. And and, and you can't live up to the promise because it was too big. You can't be perfect in the promise because, well, look who you're talking about. Peter found that out, didn't he? Because after he made that promise, he denied Jesus three times. He was lower than low. 
He was feeling all those emotions we talked about, isolated and alone and, and defeated. And he was crushed. He was that meat lost in the back of the fridge <laughs> that you discover after it's seven days expired. I'm looking at my wife now because it's just happened this past week. Nobody wants that meat anymore. You open it up thinking, maybe it's still good. Oh, no, it's not. Straight to the garbage. It's unwanted, isolated, forgotten, alone. Ideally, for the meat's sake, it stays in the fridge and it stays forgotten. Because it doesn't want anybody to find out the reason for its guilt. It's not just what guilt does to Peter. It's what guilt does to us, isn't it? It turns us into miserable, weary, disappointed, sometimes even duplicitous people. But you know what God does with guilt? He gives grace. And, and maybe that sounds obvious, but, but if you fast forward to John 21, what is, what is Jesus doing? He's asking Peter, do you love me? And <laughs> Three times Peter gets asked this question, and three times as the question is asked, Peter seems to be more grieved by it, right? Three times that the like, knife is twisted. Come on, Jesus, do you have to ask again? You know I love you, Peter says. But finally, Jesus says to Peter, those same words that he spoke to him at the beginning, follow me. And Peter's welcomed back in and welcomed back. He gets that fresh start, that clean state, slate that you know Peter needed, you know Peter wanted after doing exactly what he said he wouldn't do. Just goes to show that Jesus doesn't wait for us to get it all together. He doesn't wait until we've conquered our demons and, and won all of our battles and fin finally finished experiencing that temptation that we keep falling to. Jesus calls sinners, and he calls them to repentance, yes, but while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While Peter was denying Jesus, what was Jesus doing? He was headed to the cross. He was preparing for the death that would save Jesus, that would save Peter from the very guilt that he was crushed under giving him life and hope and a future that he so desperately needed. And in our lives, when, when we focus on, on looking at ourselves and looking at our guilt, we're going to see nothing else. But all we need to do is look to the cross. And what do we see there? An another G word. <laughs> Grace. We see our guilt nailed to that cross, and it stays there. And what do we see more clearly? Grace. Grace to cover over that guilt, to wipe it away, wash it clean so that we don't have to bear the weight of that sin anymore. For Peter, that grace meant a beautiful comeback. It's Peter who stands up at Pentecost and preaches to the 3,000 who are converted that day. Peter who writes two letters of the New Testament and Peter who really is to thank for the Gospel of Mark. Peter <laughs> gets that comeback, but it has nothing to do with him. It has everything to do with what Jesus did for him. That grace is a beautiful, powerful, motivating thing. So your guilt, whatever it was, the one night stand, the white little lie, the big lie, the three too many drinks, whatever it was, your guilt experiences that same fate. Your guilt has been nailed to that cross and left there. It can terrify you. It can still make you feel small and make you feel alone and crush you if you let it. But in reality, it has no power weigh that condemnation against you that it did before. For there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All that guilt is washed away. 
So as you think on the guilt that you experience, as you think on the ways that that guilt creeps into your mind, whatever the time it creeps in and and gnaws at you and nags at you and weighs you down, remember that message of hope. And remember that message that you can tell your guilt when you need to. You don't have teeth. You aren't the lion that you used to be. For I have the lion of Judah on my side. I'm forgiven. And as you tell your guilt who is in charge, may the very peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in that same Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we, we know the individual situations in our lives that lead us to, to suffer under and wrestle with various reasons for guilt, big and small. But we also know what has been told to us in so many different ways, that Jesus t- came to take that burden of guilt away from us. Help us tonight and into the future to hand that guilt over to him, to let it be nailed to that cross and stay there, that it might not weigh us down, that it might not prevent us from the fullness of the opportunities that you have for us, big or small. And bless us to share this good news with others, that their guilt was nailed to Jesus' cross too, that in him, they have new life. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.